Hello everyone, welcome to another lecture for 3040. So today we're going to discuss modernism and all the kind of uh, important aspects of modern art and so forth. So we're going to look at the movement and legacy of modernism, and then kind of talk about a couple of the important aspects with um, artistic movements. So modernism is a tricky term because it's way too vast and the definition is far too broad. So scholars use Thomas Hardy's The Darkling Thrush as a poem for literature to pinpoint the beginning of modernism in art. It fuels the pessimistic idea that the modern world is hard and dry, that the modern world is extremely impersonal, guided by chance or chaos, rather than God's mysterious plan. So the rise of technology and science, of course, influence people uh, to view the world as unstable. Um, because again, when you are transitioning from a world that had no understanding of, you know, bacteria and all of a sudden, you know, you the whole, you know, God bless you, right? You sneeze and, you know, you, you want, need to keep your soul in. That's, you know, centuries, right? And then all of a sudden, no, it's created by these viruses, it's created by these things in our bodies and so forth. And we have industrialization, right, in terms of historical context. So you now have completely moved away from the agricultural European mindset and now moving into an industrial completely industrialization complex so you know modernism is a very important aspect because it tries to capture how and why people felt like the world was going to be chaotic so originally modernism specifically refers to artists who challenged and subverted any form of traditional art in the early 20th century so that's kind of where it comes from the term avant-garde appears for the first time to refer to works that are experimental in nature and lack some, if not all, conventions. If you want to blame people for modern art, one of the best people to do would be Ezra Pound, because he calls art fresh and new, right? That art must be fresh and new. And this really encapsulates the modernist impulse, but it also really explains where we are in today's artistic kind of realms where you know we have to make it fresh we have to make it new right it has to be new 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 right so we can't just celebrate old art we have to make it new right we have to make it different so now modernism is more of a blank term for many of these different ideas but this is essentially the origin point right that modern art should be controversial it should be challenging it should be breaking forms it should be different and new and so forth and so that's generally where you know the original kind of modernism comes from right those kind of ideas the problem is that now you know modernism specifically refers to uh, before uh, you know um, the nuclear age so it it gets really complicated so you will see scholars talk about modernism which is basically from 1901 to 1945 Postmodernism, which is from 1945 to 1980, and then even post postmodernism, which is 1990s to present. I hate these terms. They're stupid. <laughs> they're, they're silly and semantic. These distinctions, though, are important for historical context, which is why cultural studies has better terms for these. So they show important events of each period. So modernism, basically, World War I and World War II, right? The invention of the car, airplane, tank, weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear age, right? The civil rights movement, Vietnam, right? That's why those kind of terms in cultural studies are a little bit better than postmodernism. And then, of course, post post, nope, just called the digital age, right? That's what is still guiding art, everything, right? Culture, society, all sorts of dynamics, right? Digital age, right? That's where we're still in. If you see everybody say post post, just say nope, digital age, right? That is what cultural studies people refer to, right? And historians and so forth. But they are important because it distinguishes how art has changed, you know, in the 20th century and of course in the 21st century. So I want you for one of the homeworks to analyze these works. These are real works. They were exhibited in museums throughout the world. This is when it was first captured. This is Tracy Emin's 1998 piece, My Bed. And this was first uh, featured in the uh, Museo uh, Bolzin Bolzano in Italy. And this is from John Morse called Fluid Motion in Palm Springs Art Museum. Yes, they are trash bags. They are too, um, there's nothing in them besides trash. Yes, this is a recreation of someone's bed. That's it. So I want you to focus on those kind of dynamics. 
would you do and do you consider this art now important aspects with the movements that spring from modernism or influence modernism are the major kind of overarching movements in art there are numerous movements in art throughout the last hundred years or so but these movements really influence modern literature and art realism starts before modernism modernism isn't a thing but it does influence modern art and of course naturalism these two artistic movements happen way before modernism is a thing but again they influence once modernism takes hold you have absurdism and magic realism and these two are really driving forces for modern art as well as realism naturalism kind of fell out of favor um, but those four are the kind of overarching movements that still influence modern art today there are other movements that again are occurring at the exact same time that overlap you have expressionism impressionism you have surrealism dadaism we just don't have time in our literature class to talk about these but they are important for literature film art theater and so forth if you're interested explore what these movements are they're a lot of fun there's a, a great work that come from these periods and movements but again we just don't have time but we do have time to talk about the major four. So naturalism is an artistic movement that really was popular between 1880 and 1940s. And Hitler basically ruined it. But, you know, basically it, racism and Hitler basically ruined this one. But it relies on what we call detailed realism, which means that it depicted everyday life without romanticizing any kind of element. The main difference between realism and naturalism is that naturalism suggests that no one can rise above or escape social conditions. No one can escape hereditary and no one can escape environment. It's a very pessimistic viewpoint, even though um, it's interested in kind of hyper realism and so forth at times, they still have this overarching philosophy that everything is set you know, that, that you can't move beyond your social conditioning. Emil Zola is the founder of this movement. So if uh, you're interested in those kind of um, works, Stephen Crane, if you're interested in American literature, is probably the most um, well-respected naturalistic uh, writer for American literature. But it is very limiting, and it stops with World War II. Once you have extreme ideas of, you know, limiting heredity, uh, heredity, you know, you, you just racism just ruins this uh, belief. But the nature versus nurture discussion, which naturalism kind of created, is still relevant, you know, somewhat, you know, and so we still have that discussion about nature versus nurture. But other than that, naturalism isn't really a thing. The other three movements are so realism is still in place today. It is the trend to depict life, people, society as they are. It, you know, basically realistic and realist authors rebelled against any idealistic and any romanticized presentations of people, events, and so forth. They rebelled against romanticism and what romanticism was doing at the time. Realist authors sought to capture everyday life without ignoring controversial or taboo subject matter. So it originates in France after the revolution ends in 1848. And again, its main goal is to present the truth. And I think this uh, you know, image says all about realism. But that's the kind of key issue is, is how real things are. Right. And even though in past we had ideas like verisimilitude coming from the Greeks, this was not a drive to represent the real. It was, no, we are depicting real as real as we can through fictional characters absurdism is a great uh, artistic movement that's still alive today it, it originates from uh, soren kirkregaard who's the founder of existentialism and basically explores the conflict between the human compulsion to create meaning or search for meaning in life and the impossibility that humans can ever find true meaning so even if absurdist and Samuel Beckett would be a great one to look at for literature. Even when absurdists try to write absurd 
literature, people will inevitably find meaning significance in the work. And so they laugh at that. Absurdist writers often claim that people cannot find any real purpose in life because everything is inherently meaningless, yet we still create meaning. So there's the absurdity, right? Regardless of this impossibility of ever finding truth, absurdist writers posit that humans will always make meaning in order to feel good about themselves. And that's where the absurdist kind of philosophy comes from. So it's an important aspect. And when you look at, again, uh, anything on Adult Swim today is a great example of absurdist humor, absurdist works, and so forth. But it stems from the idea that life is meaningless, but yet we will always pretend meaning exists. So it's the absurd nature of humanity. And, you know, it has a lot of important aspects and, you know, it really kind of fuels modern art. The last one is really popular and it has been popular for at least good 20 years in America to really see the heightened popular of magical realism. And you can see it in film, you can see it in TV shows, and you can see it in literature. Magical realism juxtaposes magical elements with realistic ones and places magical elements within an otherwise mundane or regular environment. So we're not talking about Harry Potter. We're talking about very specific works that most everything else is normal, but there's just one element of magic to it. The term originates from Franz Rowe, uh, the modern understanding of the definition term, though, appears in the 1950s. So it's the rise of Latin writers beginning in the 1940s, and they blend the real and fantastic, and this blending becomes very popular. The best example I could give you, the most famous writer, is uh, Jorge Luis Borges. So this writer really solidifies magical realism as a movement. A current example would be Life of Pi. And this is a good example of magical realism because it's a work in which um, Jan Martel has the character Pi relate a magical story and then a realistic one that shows the differences between realism and magical realism. It would be nice if we could communicate with animals, right? But is it real or is it fiction? And so magical realism, again, is not fantasy. Everything is set in realistic settings, realistic characters, everyday characters. But there's some sort of magical element to it, right? So think of um, TV shows like Medium or Horse Whisperer or things like that, where, you know, there's just this sense that magic can exist in an otherwise mundane universe. Now, modern literature is ever-changing, and that's the kind of crucial aspect to understand with literature today is that it is ever changing we today's literature is a culmination of every single movement because you could still argue we're under a romantic paradigm when we look at melodrama however other artists are focusing more on realism other artists are focusing on magic realism other focuses are absurd or existential and, and expressionist and so all these things are kind of the culmination of modernism that literature is ever changing and it's important to look at all the legacies of modernism. We can pinpoint historical origins, but we can only guess where modern literature is headed, right? You know, with uh, incubators being very popular to uh, can kind of convey poetry, you know, obviously digital art, digital media is going to influence how even novels are going to be written and, you know, shown to the public. As culture changes, so will modern literature. But again, understanding the origin point is important, right, when approaching literary periods and all that that we have read and will read in the future. Literature in any period is never self-contained, and that's kind of crucial, right, that literature is never self-contained, that modern literature is a culmination of all these different artistic movements, all these different artistic rebellions and so forth, and artistic philosophies and ideas of changing aesthetics and so forth. So when we look at modernism and when we look at all the works that are going to fit in with this kind of period, we want to think about, again, the complexities, but really main ideas always challenging what we know and what we consider is art. That really is the legacy of modernism. Obviously, if you need this lecture in alternative formats, please contact ARC. If not, best of luck to you with all the assignments and take care.